Good evening students, welcome back to The Time, the channel in which every week we flip through the pages of human knowledge and read about whoever or whatever we land on. And today we are learning about the life and times of Chicago mobster Alphonse Capone. So if learning about the lives of some of history's most prominent people in podcast form is your thing, then consider subscribing to the channel, making the like button an offer it cannot refuse, and leave a comment down below. Okay, let's go. Capone was born in Brooklyn, New York on January the 17th, 1899. His parents were Italian immigrants, Gabrielle Capone and Teresa Capone. His father was a barber and his mother was a seamstress, both born in Angri, a small commune outside of Naples in the province of Salerno. The Capone family had immigrated to the United States in 1893 by ship, first going through Fiumi, a port city in what was then Austria-Hungary. The family settled at 95 Navy Street in the Navy Yard section of Brooklyn. Gabrielle Capone worked at the nearby barbershop at 29 Park Avenue. When Al was 11, he and his family moved to 38 Garfield Place in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Gabrielle and Teresa had eight other children. Vincenzo Capone, who later changed his name to Richard Hart and became a prohibition agent in Homer, Nebraska. Raphael James Capone, also known as Ralph Bottles Capone, who took charge of his brother's beverage industry. Salvatore Frank Capone, Amina Capone, who died at the age of one, Amino John Capone, Albert Capone, Matthew Capone, and Mathilda Capone. Ralph and Frank worked with Al Capone in his criminal empire. Frank did so until his death on the 1st of April 1924. Ralph ran the bottling companies, both legal and illegal early on and was also the front man for the Chicago outfit for some time until he was imprisoned for tax invasion in 1932. Capone showed promise as a student but had trouble with the rules at his strict parochial Catholic school. His schooling ended at the age of 14 after he was expelled for hitting a female teacher in the face. He worked at odd jobs around Brooklyn, including a candy store and a bowling alley. From 1916 to 1918, he played semi-professional baseball. Following this, Capone was influenced by gangster Johnny Torrio, whom he became to regard as his mentor. Capone married May Josephine Coughlin, at the age of 19, on December the 30th, 1918, she was an Irish Catholic and earlier that month had given birth to their son, Albert Francis Sonny Capone. Albert lost most of his hearing in his left ear as a child. Capone was under the age of 21 and his parents had to consent in writing to the marriage. By all accounts, the two had a happy marriage, despite his criminal lifestyle. Capone initially became involved with small-time gangs that included the Junior 40 Thieves and the Bowery Boys. He then joined the Brooklyn Rippers and then at the most powerful Five Points Gang based in Lower Manhattan. During this time, he was employed and mentored by fellow racketeer Frankie Yale, a bartender in a Coley Island dance hall and saloon called the Harvard Inn. Capone inadvertently insulted a woman whilst working at the door and he was slashed with a knife three times on the left side of his face by her brother Frank Galuccio. The wounds led to the nickname Scarface, which Capone loathed. The date when this occurred has been reported with inconsistencies. When Capone was photographed, he hid the scarred left side of his face, saying that the injuries were war wounds. He was called Snorky by his closest friend, a term for a sharp dresser. In 1919, Capone left New York City for Chicago at the invitation of Johnny Torrio, who was imported by crime boss James Big Jim Colissimo as an enforcer. 
Capone began in Chicago as a bouncer in a brothel where he contracted syphilis. Timely use of Salvarsian probably could have cured the infection, but he apparently never sought treatment. In 1923, he purchased a small house at 7244 South Prairie Avenue in the Park Manor neighborhood in the city's south side for what was then a reasonable price of $5,500. According to the Chicago Daily Tribune, hijacker Joe Howard was killed on the 7th of May 1923 after he tried to interfere with the Capone Torrio bootleg beer business. In the early years of the decade, his name began appearing in newspaper sports pages, where he was described as a boxing promoter. Torrio took over Colissimo's crime empire after the latter's murder on the 11th of May 1920, in which Capone was suspected of being involved. Torrio headed an essentially Italian organised crime group that was the biggest in the city, with Capone as his right-hand man. He was very wary of being drawn into gang wars and tried to negotiate agreements over territory with rival crime groups. The smaller Northside gang, led by Dean O'Bannon, came under pressure from the Jenner brothers, who were allied with Torrio. O'Bannon found that Torrio was unhelpful with the encroachment of the Jenners into the North Side. Despite his pretensions to being a settler of disputes, in a fateful step, Torrio arranged the murder of O'Bannon at his flower shop on November 10th, 1924. This placed Jaime Weiss as the head of the gang, backed by Vincent Drukey and Bugs Moran. Weiss had been close with O'Bannon and the Northsiders made it a priority to get revenge for his killers. In January 1925, Capone was ambushed, leaving him shaken but unhurt. Twelve days later, Torrio was returning from a shopping trip when he was shot several times. After recovering, he effectively resigned and handed control over to Capone. Aged only 26, he became the new boss of the organisation that took in illegal protection, breweries and transportation networks that reached to Canada with political and law enforcement protection. In return, he was able to use more violence to increase revenue. An establishment that refused to purchase liquor from him often got blown up, and as many as 100 people were killed in such bombings during the 1920s. Rivals saw Capone as being responsible for the proliferation of brothels in the city. Capone indulged in custom suits, cigars, gourmet food, drink and female companionship. He was particularly known for his flamboyant and costly jewellery. His favourite responses to questions about his activities were, quote, I am just a businessman giving the people what they want, end quote, and, quote, all I do is satisfy the public demand, end quote. Capone had become a national celebrity and a talking point. The protagonists of Chicago's politics had long been associated with questionable methods and even newspaper circulation wars, but the need for bootleggers to have protection in City Hall introduced a far more serious level of violence and graft. Capone is generally seen as having an appreciable effect in bringing about the victories of Republican William Hale Thompson, especially in the 1927 mayoral race, where Thompson campaigned for a wide open town, at one time hinting that he'd reopen illegal saloons. Such a proclamation helped his campaign gain the support of Capone, and he allegedly accepted a contribution of $250,000 from the gangster. In the 1927 mayoral race, Thompson beat William Emmett Dever to, by a relatively slim margin. Thompson's powerful Cook County political machine had drawn on the often parochial Italian community, but this was in tension with his highly successful courting of the African-American community. 
Another politician, Joe Esposito, became a political rival of Capone, and on March the 21st, 1928, Esposito was killed in a drive-by shooting in front of his house. Capone continued to back Thompson. Voting booths were targeted by Capone's bomber, James Belcastro, in the wards where Thompson's opponents were thought to have widespread support. On the polling day of April 10th, 1928, in the Pineapple primary, causing the deaths of at least 15 people, Bel Castro was accused of the murder of lawyer Octavius Granady, an African American who challenged Thompson's candidate for the African American vote, and was chased through the streets on polling day by cars of gunmen before being shot dead. Four policemen were among those charged along with Bel Castro, but all charges were dropped after key witnesses recanted their statements. An indication of the attitude of local law enforcement at the time towards Capone's organisation came about in 1931 when Bel Castro was wounded in a shooting. Police suggested to sceptical journalists that Bel Castro was an independent operator. A 1929 report by the New York Times connected Capone to the 1926 murder of Assistant State Attorney William H. McSwiggin. The 1928 murders of Chief Investigator Ben Newark and former mentor Frankie Yale. Capone was widely assumed to have been responsible for ordering the 1929 St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Despite being at his Florida home at the time of the massacre, the massacre was an attempt to eliminate Bugs Moran, head of the Northside gang, and the motivation for the plan may have been that the fact that some expensive illegal whiskey imported from Canada via the Detroit River had been hijacked whilst it was being transported to Cook County, Illinois. Moran was the last survivor of the Northside gunman. His succession had come about because his similarly aggressive predecessors, Weiss and Vincent Drusey, had been killed in the violence that followed the murder of the original leader, Dean O'Bannon. To monitor their targets, habits and movements, Capone's men rented an apartment across the road from the trucking warehouse and garage at 2122 North Clark Street, which served as Moran's headquarters. Dressed as police officers to initiate a police raid, the faux police lined the seven victims along a wall and signalled for accomplices armed with machine guns and shotguns. Moran was not among the victims. Photos of the slain victims shocked the public and damaged Capone's image. Within days, Capone received a summons to testify before a Chicago grand jury on charges of federal prohibition violations, but he claimed to be too unwell to attend. In an effort to clean up his image, Capone donated to charities and sponsored a soup kitchen in Chicago during the Great Depression. The St. Valentine's Day massacre led to a public disquiet about Thompson's alliance with Capone and was a factor in Anton J. Cermak winning the mayoral elections on April 6, 1931. In the wake of the St. Valentine's Day massacre, Walter A. Strong, publisher of the Chicago Daily News, asked his friend President Herbert Hoover for federal intervention to stem Chicago's lawlessness. He arranged a secret meeting at the White House just two weeks after Hoover's inauguration. On March 19th, 1929, Strong joined by Frank Loesch of the Chicago Crime Commission and Laird Bell made their case to the president. In Hoover's 1952 memoir, the former president reported that Strong argued, quote, Chicago was in the hands of the gangsters that the police and the magistrates were completely under their control. That the federal government was the only force by which the city's ability to govern itself could be restored. At once I directed that all the federal agencies concentrate upon Mr Capone and his allies." End quote. That meeting launched a multi-agency attack on Capone and his organisation. Treasury and Justice Departments developed a plan for income tax prosecutions against Chicago mobsters and a small elite squadron of Prohibition Brewer agents 
whose members included Elliot Ness, were deployed against bootleggers. In a city used to corruption, these lawmen were incorruptible. Charles Schwartz, a writer for the Chicago Daily News, dubbed them, quote, the untouchables, end quote. To support federal efforts, Strong secretly used his newspaper's resources to gather and share intelligence on the Capone outfit. On March 27th, 1929, Capone was arrested by FBI agents as he left a Chicago courtroom after testifying to a grand jury that was investigating violations of federal prohibition laws. He was charged with contempt of court for feigning illness to avoid an earlier court appearance. On March 16, 1929, Capone was arrested in Philadelphia for carrying a concealed weapon. On May 17, 1929, Capone was indicted by the grand jury and a trial was held before Philadelphia Municipal Court Judge John E. Walsh. Following the entering of a plea by his attorney, one of guilty, Capone was sentenced to a prison term of one year. On August 8, 1929, Capone was transferred to Philadelphia's Eastern State Penitentiary. A week after his release, in March 1930, Capone was listed as the number one public enemy on the unofficial Chicago Crime Commission's widely publicised list. In April 1930, Capone was arrested on vagrancy charges when visiting Miami Beach. The governor had ordered sheriffs to run him out of the state. Capone claimed that Miami police had refused him food and water and threatened to arrest his family. He was charged with perjury for making these statements, but was acquitted after a three-day trial in July of that year. In September, a Chicago judge issued a warrant for Capone's arrest. And in the September, a Chicago judge issued a warrant for Capone's arrest yet again, this time again on charges of vagrancy, and then used the publicity to run against Thompson in the Republican primary. In February 1931, Capone was tried on the contempt of court charge. In court, Judge James Herbert Wilkerson intervened to reinforce questioning of Capone's doctor by the prosecutor. Assistant Attorney General Mabel Walker Willebrandt recognised that mob figures publicly led lavish lifestyles yet never filed tax returns and thus could be convicted of tax evasion without requiring hard evidence to get testimony about their other crimes. She tested this approach by prosecuting a South Carolina bootlegger. The Supreme Court ruled in United States v. Sullivan that the approach was legally sound Legally earned income was subject to income tax. Judge Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. rejected the argument that the Fifth Amendment protected criminals from reporting illegal income. The IRS Special Investigation Unit chose Frank J. Wilson to investigate Capone, with the focus on his spending. The key to Capone's conviction on tax charges was proving his income, and the most valuable evidence in that regard originated in his offer to pay tax. Ralph, his younger brother, and a gangster in his own right, was tried for tax evasion in 1930. Ralph spent the next three years in prison after being convicted in a two-week trial over which Wilkerson presided. Capone ordered his lawyer to regularise his tax position. Crucially, during the ultimately abortive negotiations that followed, his lawyer stated the income that Capone was willing to pay tax on for various years, admitting income of US$100,000 for 1928 and 1929. Hence, without any investigation, the government had been given a letter from a lawyer acting for Capone, conceding his large taxable income for certain years. On March 13, 1931, Capone was charged with income tax evasion for 1924 in a secret grand jury held on June 5, 1931. 
Capone was indicted on June the 5th, 1931. Capone was indicted by a federal grand jury on 22 counts of income tax evasion from 1925 through 1929. He was released on $50,000 bail. A week later, Elliot Ness and his team of untouchables inflicted major financial damage on Capone's operations and led to the indictment on 5,000 violations of the Volstead Act. On June 16, 1931, at the Chicago Federal Building, the courtroom of Wilkerson, Capone pleaded guilty to income tax evasion and the 5,000 Volstead Act violations as part of a two and a half year prison sentence plea bargain. However, on July the 30th, Wilkerson refused to honor the plea bargain and Capone's counsel rescinded the guilty pleas. On the second day of the trial, Wilkerson overturned objections that a lawyer could not confess for his client saying that anyone making a statement to the government did so at his own risk. Wilkerson deemed that the 1930 letter to federal authorities could be admitted into evidence from the lawyer acting for Capone. Wilkerson later tried Capone only on the income tax evasion charges as he determined they took precedence over the Volstead Act charges. Much was later made of the evidence, such as witnesses and ledgers, but the strongly implied Capone's control rather than stating it. Capone's lawyers, who had relied on the plea bargain Wilkerson refused to honour and therefore had mere hours to provide for the trial. Capone's lawyers, who had relied on the plea bargain Wilkerson refused to honour and therefore had mere hours to prepare for the trial, ran a weak defence focused on claiming that, essentially, all his income was lost on gambling. This would have been irrelevant, regardless, since gambling losses can only be subtracted from gambling winnings. But it was further undercut by Capone's expenses, which were well beyond what he claimed income would support. Wilkerson's allowed Capone's spending to be presented at very great length, the government charged Capone with evasion of $215,000 in taxes on a total income of $1,038,654. During the five-year period, Capone was convinced on five counts of income tax evasion on October 17, 1931 and was sentenced a week later to 11 years in federal prison. He was also fined $50,000 plus an extra $7,692 for court costs. He was also held liable for $215,000 plus interest due on his back taxes. Upon his arrival at Atlanta, Capone was officially diagnosed with syphilis and gonorrhea. He was also suffering from withdrawal symptoms from his cocaine addiction the use of which had perforated his nasal septum. Capone was competent at his prison job of stitching soles on shoes for eight hours a day, but his letters were barely coherent. He was seen as a weak personality and so out of his depth dealing with bullying fellow inmates that his cellmate, a seasoned convict, Red Rudinensky, feared that Capone might have a breakdown. Rudensky was formerly a small-time criminal associate of Capone and found himself becoming a protector of Capone. The conspicuous protection of Rudensky and other prisoners drew accusations from less friendly inmates and fueled suspicion that Capone was receiving special treatment. Due to his good behaviour, Capone was permitted to play banjo in the Alcatraz prison band, the Rock Islanders which gave regular Sunday concerts for other inmates. Capone also transcribed the song Madonna Mia, creating his own arrangement as a tribute to his wife, May. At Alcatraz, Capone's decline became increasingly evident, as neurosyphilis progressively eroded his mental faculties. His formal diagnosis of syphilis of the brain was made in February 1938, he spent the last year of his Alcatraz prison sentence in the hospital section, confused and disorientated. 
Capone completed his term in Alcatraz on January the 6th, 1939, and was transferred to the Federal Correctional Institute at Terminal Island in California to serve out his sentence for contempt of court. He was paroled on November 16th, 1939, after his wife, May, appealed to the court based on his reduced mental capacities. Due to his failing health, Capone was released from prison on November 16th, 1939 and referred to the John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore for the treatment of paresis caused by late-stage syphilis. Hopkins refused to admit him on his reputation alone, but Union Memorial Hospital accepted him. Capone was grateful for the compassionate care that he received and donated two Japanese weeping cherry trees to Union Memorial Hospital. A very sickly Capone left Baltimore on March 20th, 1940. After a few weeks of inpatient and then outpatient care for Palm Island, Florida in 1942 after mass production of penicillin was started in the United States. Capone was one of the first American patients treated by this new drug, though it was too late for him to reverse the damage done to his brain. It did slow down, however, the progression of the disease. In 1946, his physician and a Baltimore psychiatrist examined him and concluded that Capone had the mentality of a 12-year-old boy. He spent the last years of his life at his mansion in Palm Island, Florida, spending the time with his wife and his grandchildren. On January the 21st, 1947, Capone had a stroke. He regained consciousness and started to improve, but contracted bronchopneumonia. He suffered a cardiac arrest on January the 22nd, and on January the 25th, surrounded by his family, Alfonso Capone died. He was originally buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery in Chicago. In 1950, Capone's remains, along with those of his father, Gabriel, and brother, Salvatore, were moved to Mount Carmel Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. And that brings to an end the life and times of Alfonso Capone of the Chicago Outfit. I must say it was a privilege and a pleasure to... Um, to research this particular episode and to narrate it for you guys in a podcast form i know i've got well not a lot of subscribers at the moment but my videos are picking up and they are um they're getting views so i thought i would really stick to one method of getting my content out there and i thought the best way to do that would be to do it in podcast form so if you guys are working if you are exercising if you are driving or whatever the situation may be you could learn something new and either be entertained or be astounded or to feel informed um that's what i wanted this channel to be uh, and as i say the the views are picking up now so if this is your type of thing by all means subscribe to the channel hit the notification bell let me know what you think down below of the subject and my my uh format am i good at this i mean i'm new to youtubing so i don't know if i'm very good <laughs> at the moment anyway i'm ranting now uh thank you very much for watching Hope you'll tune back in for the next video. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.